Welcome to Commu Citizens for Community Media. This is Peter Halland with Robert Smith. We are highlighting tonight the talk by Ed Sackley. He was the keynote speaker at the Central States Alliance for Community Media that was held here in April, just this last April, in South Bend. The talk was at the luncheon at the Tippy Canoe Place. And Ed Sackley um, <clears throat> is an excellent speaker. Uh, he was in Lansing at the conference the year before, and we were able to um, interview him and put it up uh, on the YouTube and on Channel 99. Uh, this talk uh, that you're going you're gonna to watch here in about seven or eight minutes goes through and explains the importance uh, for a community to have uh, public access. And Ed Sackley is qualified. He uh, was a uh, member of the city council there in Portage, which is like a suburb of Kalamazoo. I think Portage, Michigan has about 45,000 people, and they coordinate with the Kalamazoo area on their community media. Uh, he was also an uh, acting mayor of Portage for a while. Uh, he, um, he has a reputation for graduating out of uh, Evanston in, uh, near Chicago, and they bought the, the radio station in Kalamazoo, and they were super successful with that. And um, with the money he's got from that sale, he's given himself to like really promote uh, a lot of things. In fact, right before he came up for the conference here in April, he was down with, uh, in Nicaragua, I think it was, with Habitat for Humanity. But one of the passions he has, he really wants to see public access um, make it in the communities, especially in, in our area here. And I think, um, Bob, you, you got to meet him prior. Yes, yes. yes. Um, this alliance um, is made up of um, uh, members who, who um, some own public access um, stations, some are, 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 are simply just producers of shows, but they all have an interest in public access and they want to see it grow. From a politician's point of view, one of the things a politician always wants to do is to get his views out, you know. And also he, he wants to hear from the public just what their needs are and, and their views. So, so he learned um, early in his just political career how important it was for him to communicate to the, the constituents of his uh, small city. And, um, and also those people, they were able to give him feedback, you know. Now, what he learned from this experience is something that each person can uh, take back to their own city. Uh, politicians have to communicate to the populace and the citizens have to let the politicians know what their feelings are. Having a public access channel provides that for the politicians just as well as the ordinary citizens. Also, uh, uh, the, the two can get together on the same show, and it can be seen uh, widely by the uh, citizens of their area. Um, uh, Ed is a very um, persuasive uh, speaker. He has a lot of experience, and it was entertaining to listen to him, but but he also gave facts out, and, and, and then those facts um, uh, backed up his opinions, such that here in South Bend, like we hope that public access continues to grow, and we hope that the audience also grows. And also, we, we need to find a way to uh, test audience um, um, feedback in viewership and and hopefully in the future we will uh, have a means by which we can do that um, the uh, 
the conference was well attended. People came from uh, South Bend here. People came from the state of Michigan, um, uh, um, Illinois, and Ohio, and and Kentucky. Uh, so it's not just a small uh, uh, area. Uh, the the people represented the Midwest. So um, so I hope that um, I will have the opportunity to attend future conferences, and I, and I hope to put into practice what I learned from the people I met, and um, and the lunch at uh, Tippecanoe was great. It was filling. I was still full when I woke up that morning after <laughs> the lunch, you know. Uh, uh, so I thank the uh, uh, people who put the conference on for planning that lunch, and, um, and I'll let pe uh, Peter just explain more about it. Well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're doing this. Uh, we're trying to promote, obviously, our organization is a nonprofit. We're trying to promote... Uh, community media, or you could say public uh, access. Uh, what we're seeing is that communities are really benefiting when they own their own channel, and only that community accesses that channel. And that way, um, politicians, uh, local news, uh, they find that the most watched um, show in a town is like local news. And when they film uh, city uh, council meetings, generally they'll say that's the most watched public access show, which means people do want to participate. They do want to uh, live their life a little bit through their representative. I mean, that is their representative. That representative represents their interest. And now here's a chance to, to choose somebody, vote for somebody that you feel clo closest represents your interest. So if you're interested in seeing the public schools improve, if you're interested in seeing uh, as certain aspects of your city improve, well, you can work toward that, and you can have a voice where before, if you didn't have your own channel in your town, you might have to write a letter to the editor. Right. And sometimes, you know... Sometimes that letter is uh, printed, and, and most times not, you know. Right, and, the, and the, the whole idea of public access originally, and it kind of started back in 1970, and the FCC saw it as a way especially to help inner cities. It saw it as a way for the community to defend itself from the mega corporations, which kind of monopolize and, and, and often propagandize uh, the news. And you're more apt to have less propaganda from the big money when it comes to, you know, how are we to think on political issues where you can have local people do their own research, talk the language of the local people, and maybe see through some of these things that are happening in our nation. They kind of right. want us to think a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and um, we, we in South Bend sh should be taking, taking advantage of the public access channel we have. Um, so far, most of the shows are religious shows. Uh, uh, which is good, but but um, uh, in time those shows should have their own channel. You know, um, mm -hmm. we need more um, more this community shows there in which different segments of the um, population can talk about what's going on in in their own distinct this community. You know there. Some communities uh, are in need of um, sidewalks and curbs, you know. Others are in need of parks. Others have a, uh, a difficult time in fighting crime. Uh, um, all these needs, you know, every area in the city does not have the same needs, but the community leaders in those areas need a way of expressing those needs such that the local politicians can can hear those needs. Um, most people don't go to city council to express their their needs. They simply talk about them with their neighbors, 
and, and, and they talk. And the more they talk, the more frustrated they get, you know. Um, uh, if they do travel to city council to express their needs, they only have three minutes at the end of city council just to talk about their needs. It takes more than three minutes, such that if there was a um, television show, uh, one or two shows even, that those residents could come on to talk about their needs. They could ha have a much larger audience and the politician definitely would hear it. And also, they may get some help from, from other people just expressing to them how to get the politicians to move on, on their needs. Uh, Bob, what you were saying here, Ed Sackley here, which you're about to watch for about 38 minutes, uh, he's going to repeat some of the things that you were mm -hmm. just saying. So you're going to uh, enjoy Ed Sackley, uh, his talk at Tippy Canoe at the, uh, in, just at the end of April here at the, at the ACM conference. Uh, he is going to go into his experience with public access and why you could consider it. It's kind of vital for a local community to have that if they want to really uh, put democracy at its best points in the practice where the people are um, participating in a real strong way in their community. So this is uh, Ed Sackley, and after that we will then uh, comment on, um, on the talk. First of all, I want to thank Otto and Elizabeth and Peter. Peter's the one that invited me. I came down and talked to a little tabletop group in Mishawaka about a year ago. And he said, can you take this show on the road again? I said, okay. Um, we, we went through some HDMI crises earlier. Otto rescued us. And if you see the screen like, go off and back on again, Otto and I have agreed that's when you're blinking. <laughs> it has nothing to do with any of the equipment. This is not, uh, hopefully it will, it will not blink less than it does. Um, I'm not known as being politically correct, so if there's politically correct people in the room, this is whether it's respect to ask, access or politics or what. We're not going to get into politics, but I'm going to say some things that might get under your skin, but they're all meant to move this industry and uh, the purposes of the... You're all here to learn things. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. Some of us have, have good ideas. Some of us don't have good ideas, but sharing the ideas helps us all get better. But what I'm talking about today, what Peter, when we were down in Mishawaka and what, how this was framed, is about the importance of PEG relationships with the community. Well, with all the people, there's about 50 people in this room, if I asked 50 people each to, just, to say what their community was, I doubt we would get the same answer, because it really depends on not where you live or what the jurisdictional boundaries are or what type of government you have, but community is defined a lot of different ways. So we have to also look at, at our community access centers, how we relate to the community. We have to be able to define the community. Um, who the heck is this guy and why should I listen to him? And then you can read the little thing there in between about looking at your text messages and emails. I'm not an expert. I'm like you guys, I came up, I have a lot of life experiences, but I'm not an expert on how community access centers should relate to community. Um, I'm on the Public Media Network board. I've been on the board since 2010. I'm currently the treasurer and secretary. Um, I was an elected official. I hate the word politician, but it was a nonpartisan thing, but I was on the city council from 2005 to 2013. I served two terms. When I ran the first time, I said, if I'm elected a second time, I'm going to stop at the end of the second time, so I term limited myself. I was a council member and I also served as mayor pro tem. Portage is a city of about uh, 45,000 people. Um, but economically, we have the largest tax base in Kalamazoo County, or for that matter, I think pretty much all of Southwest Michigan. It's over $2 billion in, in taxable revenue, so we're a pretty good, good sized community. And that impacts uh, PEG in a second. I also spent uh, 11 years working for Fred Upton. He's a congressman for the 6th District, Southwest corner of Michigan. And uh, I met Fred uh, through, ra through uh, my radio station, which we'll talk about in a second. But the, Critical thing about Fred is Fred, when I first uh, got to know him, he was on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he was the chair of the Telecommunications Subcommittee, and he had the good fortune of being the chair, and he's in his third term as chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee. 
Energy and Commerce Committee as jurisdiction over telecommunication, telecommunications, health, commerce, trade, consumer protection, wide gamut of thing, which certainly includes the FCC, cable regulation, things like that. So I, I served as his representative, uh, ran the district operations uh, until 2013 when I retired. What brought me to Kalamazoo, uh, I'll jump down here, it says Federal Communications Commission, 1975 to 1988. They didn't pay me any money, but I sure felt like I worked for them because for 13 years, uh, myself and a group of, of five uh, co-conspirators that were student broadcasters at the University of Illinois, we filed an application for a 50,000 watt FM radio station in Kalamazoo. Uh, that application went through the, uh, uh, the FCC for first administrative law judge process. They were competitive applications back then, comparative hearings. We won at the administrative law judge level, we lost at the review board level, we lost at the full commission level, but then our attorney says, you have a case for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. So we sued in the D.C. Court of Appeals, basically us versus the FCC, and we won. It's only been two cases in the last 50 years where the FCC has been overturned by the appeals court on a case like this, and we were one of them. So we're fortunate we signed WRKR-FM on the air in 1988. By the way, four months and 11 days after the construction permit was, was certified, we had our tower built, studios, staff hired, marketing, billboards, everything, and we were on the air in four months. Wow. So you can do it. You can build a 500-foot a tower in that amount of time as long as you plan ahead. Uh, we were fortunate uh, five years later we bought out our <laughs> largest in-market competitor. Uh, that owned WKFR, the top rated station in town. Uh, we were a rock station. It was classic rock when we signed on. When we started it, it was the, rock, it was the music we were playing. It was all new music at the time uh, in 1975, but it was classic rock by 1988. Our largest in-market competitor was over leveraged. He bought his stations on interest-only loan. Interest rates went sky high. He couldn't make his interest payments. He said, can we put our uh, operations together? We said, sure. He had uh, 32 acres. Uh, 4,000 square foot building, the top rated station in town, an AM uh, news talker. And when we got all done, uh, we owned 72% and he had 28% because we had to pay off his debt. What well, tells you, whether it's in, in, in cable access or whatever, you, you want to make sure that you plan appropriately, you budget, you don't want things to sneak up on you later. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I worked at a commercial student radio station. That's right, a commercial student radio station. We could sell advertising. Very, very rare. I was a DJ, operations manager, production director, music director, account executive. I paid for my last two years in college strictly on commissions on selling advertising on our student radio station. Um, and it was also general manager. I had the good fortune of growing up in uh, north suburb of Chicago, Evanston. Uh, in our high school in 1968, we had color television facilities in our high school. Color television in our high school. People didn't have color TVs in their homes. But we had it. Brent Neff was our instructor. I had him for two years. Wonderful man. Got me excited about radio and TV. Okay. Questions for you. Are you relevant? When I say you, by the way, every time I'm saying you, I'm not talking about individuals in the room. I'm talking about however you want to see you as your organization, as your anticipated organization, but you is a, is a global you. Are you indispensable? And the famous quote, cemeteries are full of indispensable people. Right? Okay. Your organization, just like your community, must constantly assess, adapt, affiliate, advocate, and advance in order to thrive. I want to have some kind of hook, so I got five A words. All right? Why is stepping outside the box so critical? When I say stepping out the box, I'm using the image of the TV box, okay? Which most people, you go out in the community and ask people what's, what's access TV, community access, whatever, they're going to get it down to a box. They're not going to be thinking about all the other ways that we serve the communities now. They're going to think about primarily about a box. It's not just about your organization, it's about your community. Okay, and as, we, as I mentioned before, how do you define community, okay? Uh, for starters, are you even relevant? You ask yourself, am I relevant? And if you are, by whose measure? And relevant, again, you can define that term any way you want. Relevant, you can think that we're important, we provide a great service to the community, but if nobody knows you're doing it, nobody cares, the relevance is really irrelevant. And if you signed off tonight, whatever services you have, and you never returned, who would notice or care? 
Every community is going to be different. Every organization is going to be different. But these are questions you have to ask. As a board member, you know, I have to ask this of HAP. And the board members, you know, we, we need to make sure we, they are, we are relevant, we are viable going forward. Uh, franchise fees are fungible in many jurisdictions. What fungible means is that whoever has the franchise agreement, and by the way, it's not us, it's the community, okay, um, they, I, I know what the law is in Michigan, I don't know, I know if we have people from other states here, but in Michigan, they can choose not to have cable access, and they can also spend the money on anything they darn well please, except for the public service fee, at least in Michigan, that has to be on capital projects. So is your funding stream secure? You, you might think it is, but all it's going to take is a city council, township board, whatever, to say, we need to have some of this money to pay for a police officer, or we need to do it to put new carpeting in the city hall. The FCC's focus on community television began in 1965. That's when they first noticed uh, that there was you know, some potential for community television. There were major updates in 84, 92, and 96. Fred Upton served in Congress and got to vote on all the FCC regulations during that time. If you don't know Fred, I know that ACM, uh, the people that go out and lobby, and let's face it, we lobby, we have to do that locally, we have to do that statewide, we have to do it nationally, need to know what's going on in the, uh, in the world of Washington. Uh, state and local governments also may regulate in some ways. Michigan changed its franchise uh, laws a few years ago. But the FCC is the one ultimately that mandates that there be a franchise agreement. So it's starting in Washington, it's interpreted differently in the states. You are not a party to that agreement. As much as we might like to think we are, we are not. Uh, the lawmakers and regulators can act swiftly and with limited or incorrect information. I worked for one. He looked to me and asked me for information. Okay, I was a valuable resource to him. Do you have access to people that are voting on things that might affect your organization? Do, do the regulators know you? Do they know your community? And are you valued by them? Finally, always expect politicians and bureaucrats to act in their own self-interest. It's human nature. We all do it. When it comes right down to it, turning left or turning right, we're going to do what we think we have to do for our families, for ourselves, for our organizations. Make sure you assess, adapt, affiliate, and advocate to make your case to advance your organization and community with the people that are outside and control you. Okay. Assess yourself. Are you more than just cable nerds? Okay, this was me earlier today trying to find a working HDMI cable. Okay? And as Otto knows and other people in this room, we were freaking out. Are we going to be able to show this? You know, or is it Wayne's World? A lot of people know us by Wayne's World. That's a pretty good thing. You know, the people in Kazakhstan hated Borat because he was making, he's not from Kazakhstan. They hated him. Okay, but do you know now, I'm going to Kazakhstan in two weeks. Borat is a national hero in Kazakhstan. They worship him. They have tourism everywhere. Why? Because as much as people want to laugh or whatever, they now know about Kazakhstan because of Borat. Okay, so if you're a Saturday Night Live fan, um, you know, you might know Wayne and Garth. Here's the five words. Assess. At our core, we're public education and government. P pay, Okay. At Public Media Network, and that's a lot of my, my only experience in uh, community access is at Public Media Network and our standalone facility we had in the city of Portage up until 2010. We have five channel allocations. It's glorious to have five channels. You may say, oh my God, we have to program five channels. But having five channels, man, it gives you all kinds of, of legroom. Um, we're on both Charter and AT&T UVerse. Our channels are PMN, our public media network, which is in-house productions on weekdays, and public productions we do overflow on the weekends. Uh, the public channels, all submitted under guidelines, are the traditional approach. Spiritual, services, sermons, sacred music, theological studies, interpretive, analytical discussions, yoga, zen, whatever it might be. Um, we have a resident Buddhist, don't we? Sort of? Okay. We, we, we do everything. Government. County, city, and township. Notice I put county on there. County doesn't have a franchise agreement. We're going to get to them, why the county is important. Education, regional and local districts, homeschool, private schools, religious, and then the related sports and events. Question for you is do you embrace all of these elements within your allocation structure? Even if you only have one channel, are you acknowledging and embracing all these elements in your community? Because when it comes right down to it, 
and something's going to happen and somebody's questioning whether or not you need to continue to exist, you want to have the most defenders you can out there. They are the lifelines to your community. Public Media Network, our first channel, uh, Channel 187. It's a principal outlet for staff produced or coordinated programming. It includes both live and recorded material. Um, if this works, and we'll see if it does. Yeah, okay. Come on. Yeah, I got all kinds of things on here. Let's move. See, da, da, da. Sign in. Here we go. Up here. Here we go. Community. Um, PMN channel, for example, and I'm not going to play all these things. Um, and I don't even know if we can hear it, if the audio is working. Here we go. Audio? Maybe that too? Okay. I promise you there's audio there. There we go. Yeah, there, there definitely is audio there. Okay. Community spotlight. Da, 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 da. We're going to do a very brief profile of nonprofit organizations in the community. Stole the idea from CTN and Ann Arbor. Hell, that's stole But But you know what? It's not important. Um, no matter what you have. Okay, so, you know, we've got. Uh, let me go back here. Oh, did I do that? Okay. Okay. Um, we produce, our staff produces, and we produce in HD, even though we can't distribute in HD uh, pretty much. We produce everything in HD now. Community Spotlight program focuses on nonprofits. Uh, KIA, Kalamazoo Institute of Arts film series, focus on local filmmakers. Star Awards, local community, that actually was started by the newspaper, which pretty much doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, it's pretty much a web site. Um, it focuses on local volunteers. See, touching into all these areas of the community where there's a lot of people that feed in. Um, we had a mass shooting in Kalamazoo uh, in February. We went out and covered that, probably provided coverage in some respects you know, as well, or in some cases better than the network television people. Um, the community response to that. Colleagues International is a State Department program. They people, pe bring people to Kalamazoo, because we're a good host site, from all over the world. And they take messages back. We always have the colleagues people in our building. And uh, we actually had a group from Kazakhstan. Right? OK. Borat people. OK. Um, we also have, and I, wanna, I do want to show this, because this is, if I can get over here. There we go. Let me show you. We have up to date, here's Thursday, April 28th. We have a program guide. Our program guide is not only on our website, but we also make sure that it is distributed to the program providers so that your cable boxes and people with DVRs can go and find the programming um, and be able to set it up for a DVR for recording at a later time. This is critical. Small if you're caveat, that's charter. But our friends at AT&T, not so much. We don't right. Okay. We may. You know, what, in other words, we're pitching even if they're not catching. Yes. Okay. Right. But if you're not doing that on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis, what are you saying to your uh, customers? And by the way, your customers are the governmental units, not the people that are watching. Customers are the ones that pay. What are you saying to them if they can't go to a thing and say, "How come my city council meeting isn't on there?" Okay. Go back over to this. Okay, now uh, live streaming. We do live streaming. I could demonstrate it, but you can understand what it is. Uh, we live stream across all platforms: iPhone, iPad, Android, PC, whatever. You tell people, look, you don't have to be a cable subscriber to be able to watch our programming. And as a matter of fact, if you're a kid and you're in a school symphony performance and it's going to be on and your grandma's in Anchorage, Alaska, she can watch it too. And that is a really cool and powerful thing to have. Monday Night Live, we do, uh, actually, I don't know how many, if we got other programs, I know we, on Monday night at 7 o'clock, we actually have a live public program. I know a lot of organizations, they say, well, I don't know if I let these people go live on the air, because we don't know what they're going to do. But we do have some live programming. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
this, I'm just plugging this one because I'm going to be on Monday night at 7 o'clock. So. Okay, uh, continuing on, uh, public channel, these are questions, and these are the things that tie in. Do you know, members of your community are producing programming? YouTube, over 900 million. But let's sort of throw that aside because YouTube is old school, it's got copyright issues, you can't put anything on YouTube. What about Vimeo? 130 million on Vimeo. These are stats as of the end of March. Vimeo, 130 million. Daily Motion, 100 million. Twitch, 100 million. Live Leak, 45 million. And they're on and on and on. Lots of niche stuff. How are you relating to the people that are producing programming that are putting it on these channels? Are those people in your building? Are they putting that programming on your channels? Do they know you exist? Do they know you can support them? What if they need extra cameras, lighting, microphones, things like that to produce their pro, or come in and edit the stuff down? All we ask is that anything that you're doing, that you're going to upload, we also have to be able to run on our channels. You can provide access to professional equipment, software, and facilities, whatever you have. These are people that may not be there now, but they're out in your community making this stuff. They have huge audiences, perhaps. You may, may want to look and see who in your community is doing that and invite them in. You can connect them with like-minded aspiring producers and technicians. If somebody has an idea that they want to do something bigger than what their budget limits them to or what their equipment limits them to do, you're a pooling resource for them. They can come in and connect in your organization. And you can provide focused local distribution and promote it. They throw something up on Vimeo, you know, what do they do? Going on their Facebook page, telling everybody, go watch my thing on Vimeo? They're trying to get something like that? If it's something locally focused, you're already there. And you can help them cut through the clutter of the thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people that are up on their channel. Spiritual channel. We used to have our spiritual programming scattered across our channels. And we made a decision a few years ago out of respect for those that are providing the spiritual programming and respect to the, list, to the viewers who are watching one thing and then it goes to a sermon and they're, you know, they're tuning out. We put all of our spiritual programming on one channel, but there's spiritual programming on Tangle, My Praise, and My Faith. Again, people in your community, congregations, church, faith groups are putting stuff together and putting it online. The up-to-date program listings cover them. The live streaming covers that channel. And these groups, churches, faith community, spiritual groups, are everywhere in your community. They're very, very well networked. They're very passionate. They're very devoted. Are they in your place? Do they know that you can provide focalized, focused, localized distribution with promotion for their programming and that you can help them cut through the clutter? You got a new pastor in town. He wants to get out. How is he going to get people to come and watch him on Vimeo? He, but it may be a lot easier for him to say, if you got charter, give me an amen if you got charter. Okay. Well, you go to channel 189 at 1030 on Sunday night, you can watch me. Okay. Government. Okay. These are your customers, not the cable subscribers. We know why, because they're the ones that send you the check. They're the ones that sign the franchise agreement. Some of them may be ardent supporters, and others may just feel obligated. Because someone told them when they got there that well, they've always done this, we always send these guys some money, so we've got to keep doing it just to keep them quiet. Otherwise, they're going to come here to a city council meeting and they're going to protest. The families paying the franchise fees don't have any control over it. They've got to pay whether they like it or not. It's on their bill, period. But now, more than ever, those folks expect to be able to watch their government work. This is a lever. This is something that you can use if you're not broadcasting your local government uh, uh, meetings live, or at the very least on some kind of tape delay, you can use that to your advantage because you can say, you should be doing it. The people want it. If you vote in the area, you want it, and you're probably others that are like you too. Transparency in the digital media age has transformative properties. Everybody's on camera now, whether you like it or not. If somebody comes to a city council meeting and they're sitting there with their iPhone and they're doing a video of the people sitting there who don't want to have cable access in the room, what are they going to do? Sergeant, tell that person to put their phone down? No. No, they're aware of it. They may not embrace it, but they're aware of it. And your participation in that supports the core mission of government. It really is. 
The core mission of government is to be transparent, to let people know what's going on, not make decisions behind closed doors. I was there for eight years. I worked for a guy who's been in Congress for 30 years. Like it or not, more people are getting engaged and they have that expectation. And you cannot overemphasize that role with local elected officials and their teams. Questions. Which government units are home to your franchise fee subscribers? Okay, you're getting a franchise fee check. What are the boundaries that cover that franchise fee? And are you aware of who those people are? Which government units are supporting cable access? If you've got, in our, in our jurisdiction, we have six local units of government that are paying franchise fees into our organization. There are others that aren't. But there's others that are served by the cable providers, by AT&T and by Charter. They can see our programming, but they're not paying in. We'd say, oh, well, they're taking advantage of it. No, but they're also not getting any of the direct benefits, but they are getting indirect benefits. County government, that's an indirect benefit. We made a decision years and years and years ago that we're going to broadcast, with the county's consent, all the county board meetings and other things that happen at the county building. They don't pay franchise fees, but every single person that's paying franchise fees that's in the county is affected by stuff the county government does as well. And then finally, does the, does the government link to your website? If you're providing programming, whether it's just the, whether it's uh, uh, live streams or whether it's delayed stuff or you know, just contemporaneous broadcast their meetings, if you go to their website, can you find you on there? Are they proclaiming the fact that you're their partner doing this? If I showed you the link, I would show you that in, in our case, yes, they are. You have to ask them, though. What traditional local media, if any, is providing regular coverage of meetings? When I was on the Portage City Council, we used to have two, well, actually, when I had my radio stations, we actually had, we'd have three radio stations, a newspaper, and depending on the agenda issues, a TV station. Now they're lucky, the freelance guy from M Live shows up there, you know, and he's paid by the story, not by the hour, and maybe, he usually gets one story. If nothing happens, he still writes a story, but that's it. You might be providing more coverage, more detailed coverage than any local media. Are government units recording their meetings, even if they're not being broadcast? Are they recording them? Are those available to people in the general public? Um, the, uh, how are you relating to your governmental units? Do they know you can support them? If they're writing your franchise fee and that's it and you don't have any other contact with them, you need to do more. You can provide access to professional staff, equipment, software, and facilities for the governmental units. The PSF fees cover capital purchases. They're paying franchise fees. It's good for you because you get eyeballs watching you if you're providing programming that's of interest to the people in the community. We have a monthly program called Connect. It's professionally produced and promoted and has information on all of our government sponsors. And we do that within PMN. We have a dedicated host for that. We go out in the field and get video. It's all produced in high D. And you can retrieve it anytime online as well as watching it according to schedule. And like all the other things, we have up-to-date up program listings and live streaming as well for the government channel. Education. Let's face it, education is generally closer to your community than government. I don't think any of us would dispute that. There's more connections into your school, even if you don't have kids in school. Your neighbors do, or you've got grandkids or nieces and nephews. Um, and families now expect to be able to watch their school boards work. Okay? They may not get off their butts and go down to a school board meeting, but if something happened to the school board meeting, they're going to be talking about it, and they may not have good information or accurate information. Schools don't pay franchise fees. But we broadcast majority, the majority of our governmental partners, the districts that are within their boundaries, we broadcast their meetings. You know, and they welcome this because it also opens up other connections as well. Um, what traditional local media coverage, again, is there for your school boards? You might be providing more than the uh, local media is providing on covering those meetings. And same thing, are education units recording their meetings and are they readily available to the public after the meeting? If something happened last night, can you go back and look at it? You know, in our case, the answer is yes. Um, what other things can you do with education? Boy, these are natural things. You know, grandma's out in Anchorage and somebody's down in Florida. Broadcast graduation ceremonies, sporting events, arts programs. They're great content. It's also great training for students because you're out doing something at the school, you're going to have kids at the school 
And maybe even some parents and teachers could say, what are you guys doing? There's future volunteers, there's your advocates. We do a monthly program, K-12 360, a monthly magazine show featuring our sponsors' school districts. Again, professionally produced, high D, retrievable, um, and the program listings are up for that, and we live stream as well. Only you can determine whether your organization is vibrant, and you're going to have to define a lot of these words, what you consider vibrant. Vibrant is just hanging on by your fingernails. Are you stagnant or are you in life support? Are you tru being truly honest or are you in denial? You know, if you're the person that's been there the longest and everybody looks to you to make all the decisions, you know, if you can't pay your electric bill some month, they're going to be looking at you to write the check because you've been there the longest. You know, you've got to plan ahead. Is your legal structure the best choice? Now, I don't know in Indiana and not even everything in Michigan, but in our situation, we are a quasi-governmental body. We're called a separate legal entity under the Urban Cooperation Act of the state of Michigan. So basically, our governmental partners are our shareholders. And they appoint representatives who constitute our board, but we're a governmental unit, okay? So um, if you're not, if you're, if you're strictly a nonprofit, if that's what you're doing, it means you're out there with your hand out like every other nonprofit in town begging for money to supplement your franchise fees. Is there another structure? I'm not saying there, there is or there isn't, but consider that whether your legal structure is the best choice. Who are your public access competitors? Some of you are in areas where there's a community that has an access center and a nearby community has an access center. Are they your competitors? Well, they're not competitors from the standpoint of what people can see in their homes. I don't know if any of the systems overlap, where you might have an access center and another access center both with Comcast and they can see both your programming. I don't know if they do that. But would you be stronger if you were larger? Think about that. It might be, well, we're going to lose our identity, but let's talk about this. Public Media Network welcomed a sixth formerly independent PEG community in 2010. That was the city of Portage. City of Portage, up till 2010, had been contracting with Portage Public Schools to run the Portage Cable Access Center. And I've said it, it's, it's years now since we made the transition, but it was crap. You had a guy running it and a secretary. They were school employees. They were in a, it was like a storage building out behind the administration building that wasn't welcoming to anybody. They really didn't have any open hours. They didn't do classes. Wait, they had classes, but for some reason you could never take one. You know, they never had, it, they never had one scheduled yet. It was, a, it was an awful mess. Yeah, they broadcast the Portage Pu City Council meetings, they broadcast the Portage Public School Board meetings, um, and they had some programming that could be submitted, but they had very limited office hours, very limited everything. We were paying them 50%. We were con the contract with the schools was 50% of our franchise fees, which was about a quarter of a million dollars. We were paying to the schools. That was half our franchise fees. We're getting nothing for it. Well, I got elected in 2005, and another council member and I were the agitators. We are saying, we can do better than this. We were aware of, uh, I think it was still called the Community Access Center at the time. Um, we were aware of that and said, you know what, we can get a lot more bang for our buck if we affiliate with, a, with Community Access Center. And we did that, and it took a couple of years to get the, the thing done. But now, and we actually, the city's paying less money. Now we're only doing 40% of our franchise fees because PMN had a better deal, and we're getting far more for it. Um, but that was the critical mass for public media network. As a treasurer, I can look at the past books and look where we are right now. Having that additional community, yeah, that's a lot of money. It's a big community. Not everybody's going to have that big enchilada they can go out and grab. But just think what you could do if your budget went up 20, 25, 30 percent because you pulled your resources with somebody else. And I said, well, but they have a director and we have a director. Who's going to be in charge? If, that's, if you're stuck at thinking at that level, you're stuck in the wrong place. You need that security of funding. Remember, these are franchise fees from governmental units, and as long as people are still paying their cable bills, that money's going to come to you. It's a good, solid revenue source. We use that money to fund a remodeling and expansion of our main facility in downtown Kalamazoo. How many additional square feet did we add? About 5,000. We added about 5,000 square feet. Okay? 
We also were able to create a separately located, by the way, in a Portage Public Schools building, because we negotiated a deal with them as part of the uh, separation agreement. We've got a great facility in the, again, the, the, the second largest community in the county, that's now host to a brand new staffed government production services unit. Those people full time, their whole job is to go out and service our governmental units. Okay? Whether it's the, the produce programming, um, keeping track of what's going on in various municipalities in terms of their technical stuff. Um, we added bandwidth. Added bandwidth, fiber hooks, I, I don't know, I don't know what, how, how much bandwidth do we have now, Hap? 100 how much? 100 megabits. Yeah, up and down. Up and down, up and down both ways. Okay. Uh, so we've got, and this we just got uh, iOS streaming, okay. Uh, so we're streaming on every platform, everywhere. Uh, we were able, also able to replace um, all the program origination equipment in each of our sponsors' meeting chambers, about 35 grand per location uh, times five. Um, an on-demand archival system and uh, soon to be live from anywhere mobile production van to replace our relic with the six pack cellular thing so we can do live from anywhere. We partner with US, uh, US Tennis Association Tennis Tournament. Kalamazoo Marathon is on Mother's Day. You can watch it if you really want to watch people run by a camera. For some reason they think it's cool, we're going to do it, so we're going to broadcast the Kalamazoo Marathon on Mother's Day live. You can watch it and we have a partner, and we have a partner providing all the bandwidth. Colleagues in the Arts Council, the Symphony Orchestra, our littlest town, Parchment, their summer festival, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts with, with, with uh, young filmmakers. Um, we brought a film festival back to life. The one that used to be in Ann Arbor is now in Kalamazoo, the North by Midwest Micro Budget Film Festival. The deal is everybody that submits an entry for that festival has to agree to allow us to put it on their channel. It's sort of like buying content, but it's really cool content we wouldn't otherwise have. And we operate a radio station. Because Kalamazoo Public Schools has an educational station, they really didn't know what to do with it. It almost went off the air because they weren't operating it. We now operate it under contract, and we have students coming and taking classes, and they're getting high school credit for coming to our building and learning about radio production and TV production and editing. Schools and other publicly affiliated organizations are natural additions to your government base. So are nonprofits, service clubs, PTOs, athletic and sports participants, you name it, and job providers, employers, okay? You likely teach classes that may be unavailable in your schools. See if you can have an arrangement like we do where people come to your facility, kids are taking classes and they're getting high school credit and we're being compensated by the intermediate school district for those kids that are coming down there. It's not on our budget. Are you, do you work with your library district? Libraries have been transformed much like community access. Libraries are the place to be right now. They've got a lot of stuff going on. Okay. You need to step outside the box. What's your secret? Share it with people. Start with the government. Do they know you? Do they value you? And do you value them other than for the franchise fee check? Remain active, engage with groups like ACM, which obviously you are. Use your connection. Encourage, energize your staff and volunteers. Listen to them. Write things down. Follow up. Plan, plan strategically and implement your plan and follow it. Um, engage current potential affiliates. You can, demand, you can create a demand for your product by demonstrating how you can add value to their missions. The beauty is you're already serving yours while you're serving theirs. And don't be shy. Ask for recognition from all your partners in print and on the web. No one's going to do this for you. If you're not the right leader or you don't have the right leadership group, admit it and look for help. Who's Edward John Smith? Anybody know? Edward John Smith. He was a captain of the Titanic. Went down with his ship. Obviously, he lacked in some leadership qualities and decision-making skills. Nobody knows who he is, but we all know his story. <laughs> Collaboration. I hate that word. I hate when someone says, you, oh, we're going to collaborate with you. But it's instructive. Look around. We're not the only media experiencing social or societal upheaval. Inventory your strengths. Detail your weaknesses. Don't reach for Band-Aids. Do more. Big picture stuff. Network with other access professionals and volunteers. We can't afford to go it alone. Market yourself on your own channels and do it professionally. We also buy time on Charter to promote our PMN programs so we get somebody who's watching a mainstream, where are we on, what channel, ESPN. Okay, you're on ESPN and you've got to drop an ESPN telling them, by the way, 
The high school football game is on tonight on this channel. And you, if you can watch this message, you can see it on your TV. Get your channel guide information posted. Finally, just step outside the box. This guy doesn't look like he's having much fun, but this guy, he's going somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully uh, you picked up some interesting things there as uh, Ed was <clears throat> going into his uh, experience with public access and, and why he thinks it's uh, important for a community to em embrace it. Um, with, we're in the middle of the summer and we're seeing uh, around the country uh, a lot of uh, inner city uh, turmoil, which of course throughout yeah. our lives we've always right. had that. Right. But I think if we're wise stewards uh, <clears throat> of our, in our community, we want to do all we can to especially harness good communication. Because, you know, they always say it, in a marriage, if you have good communication, it can be very good. And uh, a lot of that communication deals with listening. You know, Great. listening <laughs> to what are people's concerns. But also, you know, from my Christian perspective, you know, listening to what God says, too. I mean, that doesn't hurt either. You know, and, and trying to uh, put the package together. You know, you're talking about sidewalk uh, problems. Well, then there's... Spiritual problems. I mean, how does a community bring all its its concerns into a package? Mm -hmm. And you, and we do see some success around the country. Where uh, you're talking Kalamazoo, where Ed area is from, but uh, you also had at the conference uh, Ann Arbor. They have like uh, well, they have 20 city employees, 10 full time, running their community media. Kalamazoo, I don't know how many it is. Maybe it's about 10. Maybe with three or four channels, uh, Fort Wayne probably has maybe ten or twelve employees. Uh, but the cities have found out they can be proactive. They don't have to wait for the problem to occur. They can jump ahead, you know. And I think proactive is the way to go. Why why wait around till till bad things start happening? You know, you can you can um, get out ahead. Uh, see issues coming up ahead in your community and say, you know, I think we're going to have a problem up here, up ahead. Right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> use of um, television, movies, and, and radio um, um, has been just successful for, for many people. One being uh, Hitler. Um, uh, leading up to World War II, uh, uh, his... Um, uh, um, Joseph Goebbels? Right, right, right. <laughs> propaganda he had, minister. Right, right, that's what it is. Like the propaganda minister had, had made several films, you know, and, and what that did was to portray life of certain people in a uh, certain manner just to persuade other people just to think of them in that same, same way, you know, and... Um, and it showed how how Hitler was doing good for the country. It it showed children smiling, older people smiling. Um, um, everyone was happy, and and then. Um, uh, but um, we all know that um, uh, that it was just propaganda. Um, it's because uh, during the war, um, uh, all of the um, Camps were found with the uh, with some people s still alive, but uh, there were many uh, 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 skeletons found, many partially burned bodies, some fully burned b bodies there. But but the problem is um, use of the media. Um, you you can get your ideas out there, you know. Um, uh, some people do misuse it. Today we have um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, uh, Snapchat. We we have many uh, 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 many means of using uh, uh, media that is out there that we can use f for our own selves. Uh, lately, the um, Politicians who are running for uh, 
president, they have a staff of people who, who use Facebook and uh, Instagram just to get their messages out. The messages just appear to come from the candidates themselves. When you um, give them a question, it appears that the candidate has answered that question. All you're doing is sending your questions to a, uh, a person in a room. They give an answer and they put the candidate's name there. But having uh, public access here gives, gives everyone uh, access to television media. And, um, and then I'll let uh, Peter just explain how, from a Christian point of view, that could help the Christian life. Well, I think, I mean, I'm attacking it in many mm -hmm. different ways, but I'm thinking of some of the phoniness of the media from the mega corporations. I mean, an extreme example would be, you know, Rock Hudson was like, oh, the greatest movie star. Well, then it came out that he was gay. Well, that was at a time when people, like, couldn't believe it. Okay, so in other words, we don't know who those people are, but we do live locally, and we can know who we're living with locally. And if somebody comes on uh, using public access, well, you may know him at the grocery store, you may know him at the church, and you may know actually if he's good or bad. Right. Okay? Right. But the people that come on the mega, mega corporations, you really don't know them, okay? And, but you're trusting them. And that could be a risky business. Great. And so uh, we're wrapping this up, but I think it's an opportunity to know your politicians better, um, uh, kind of own your own ideas locally, and that's why we are encouraging people to continue to support uh, their public access uh, uh, facilities in their community. So this is uh, Peter Helen Robert Smith with Citizens for Community Media.